Welcome to the Gamer's Tavern. This episode is one of my favorites we've done yet, and it's all about crowdfunding. For those of you who are more on the role-playing side of things, you may not know one of our guests, Jemmy Stegmeyer, but those of us who do keep a toe in the board game area know about his breakout success using Kickstarter. We also have returning guest Mac Martin coming in a little bit late. He joins us for the second half of the podcast. But go ahead and grab a drink from the bar and take a seat in the table in the corner, and we'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. Have you been looking for a dark fantasy RPG setting? Are you interested in seeing a new take on the action horror genre? Then you should check out Accursed. Accursed is a setting for the Savage Worlds RPG created by me, Ross Watson, and my good friends Jason Marker and John Dunn. It is a world where the heroes are monsters who fight for redemption against the witches who have conquered their land. To find out more about Accursed, search for Accursed on drivethroughrpg.com. Accursed is now on sale there and in many other fine retailers for gaming PDFs. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy Accursed. Hello and welcome to episode 25 of the Gamers Tavern podcast. I'm your host, Ross Watson. And I'm Daryl Mott Jr. And tonight we have with us a Kickstarter and board game guru, Jamie Stegmeyer. Hey guys, thanks, thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on the show, Jamie. It's a pleasure to have you. So um, one thing we always like to do to tell our, our listeners is to kind of you know who you are, where they know you from in the in the gaming industry. Now, because we are primarily kind of a role-playing game podcast, uh, we do this in the framework of a character sheet. Now, I hope that your background will allow you to <laughs> to work with that paradigm. So can you can you please give us your gaming character sheet? Sure. Um, you might have to walk me through some of the specs, but I can tell you some some things that I know about myself. Well, are you an elf? I am not an elf. No, I would I would <laughs> I would say I'm more more of a wizard. I, okay. I like the, the wizard uh, cleric. I guess you call it clerics in role playing. These things exist. These things exist. Yeah. The only role playing game I played actually is the the Star Wars role playing game, and that was when I was ten, eleven, around then. So it's been a long time. Ooh. Well, you picked a good one. Yeah, it was a good one. Like you said, I'm primarily a board gamer, and I run a publishing company, a game publishing company, called Stonemeyer Games. Well, so far, we've published my designs, which are a game called Viticulture, a worker placement game set in Tuscany and, and built around the idea of running a vineyard. The second game we published is a game called Euphoria, which is a uh, kind of a dice worker placement game set in a near-future dystopia. Cool. Yeah. Those are very, very cool things. Yeah, Euphoria is one of the games I've actually talked about a little bit on the show. It's one of those games I kept saying, I can't wait to play this, and I never got around to playing. I'm so, <laughs> I'm so sorry, Jamie. It's happening soon, I promise. Well, what, I, what we should really do is use some of our podcast foo in the future and uh, try and get Jamie over onto the D6 generation, because those guys are board game nuts. And I bet they would have a, a ball talking to you about your stuff, probably more in depth, maybe than than we might be able to get. But yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm the board game guy on here, and I, even I'm not the big of a board game guy. But hey, it's it never, nevertheless it's awesome because tonight's topic is actually about crowdfunding, and Jamie knows quite a bit about that as well as his board game design stuff. Yeah, I I've kind of studied uh, Kickstarter in particular. I've studied it. Pretty much since it launched about five years ago, and I've I've run three Kickstarters, one very small one for a publishing company a couple of years ago, but the two bigger ones have been for Viticulture and for Euphoria, and I'm about to run one. I, I think it'll probably be closing out when you guys launch this podcast, but I'm about to run another one for, for another expansion, and I, I write a lot about Kickstarter on our uh, company website, kind of with the idea of trying to help out other project creators learn from... Uh, my mistakes and things that I've learned throughout the throughout running Kickstarters myself. Well, this is going to be a really interesting podcast, I think, because when I launched the Accursed Kickstarter with my good friends John Dunn and Jason Marker, we did an awful lot of research into you know what not to do and what to do, and and I think we you know put those lessons pretty well implemented into our Kickstarter. And uh, yeah, I would like definitely that's something I think we should discuss. But before we jump into that. The next thing we usually do is we talk about what we've been playing lately. So, Mr. Stegmeyer, what have you been playing lately? The, the game that I've played the most of lately is a board game called Kemet. 
It's spelled uh, K-E-M-E-T. Have you guys heard of this game? No. I- I've heard of it. Okay. <laughs> it is a an Egyptian fantasy war game. It has some connections with traditional risk, but there's I, I guess everything is done better than traditional risk. And it adds a lot of uh, Euro game elements to it. It's a lot of fun. It's a game that incentivizes attacking, so there's a lot of player interaction, and you never really feel bad for attacking any particular player uh, because it's just part of the game. You have to attack people. And so I've, I've really been enjoying that. Is this a uh, player elimination game? No, it's not. You you play until, you, uh, until you've earned eight points, and then the, the game ends soon after that. Okay, so I do know a little bit about board games, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm probably going to be like bringing up these terms that I think are like kind of cool and avant garde, and you're going to be like, "Yeah, everybody talks about that." <laughs> no, it's, right. a good, it's a good question. I, I think people, I mean, people definitely associate that with the risk. You know, you get eliminated two minutes into the game, and then you sit there for three hours while your friends finish. Kemet does not have that. You play for about an hour, hour and a half, and then the game ends. It depends on whether or not you took Australia. I believe <laughs> <laughs> that's that's true. What about right. you guys? I, I do believe I am the only person who's ever managed to eliminate a player in Small World. Really? <laughs> yeah, someone took the elves, and we wiped them off the board, and we couldn't find a rule for what to do next. Because he kept, wow. because they don't they don't go away like normal ones, and there was nowhere for him to come. Where does he come in on the board at? Does he come in like a new army? And we couldn't figure anything out, so we just said, screw it, take a new army. Wow. Every, every game has uh, some kind of quirky, you know, come back into play stuff that happens every so often. For, for a game that's been around for about a decade, and that's not on the fact, it's not on the website, that was kind of shocking. It was a combination of elves and something else, and I can't remember what it was off the top of my head, which uh, ability they had. But he got right. pushed off the board, and he had absolutely no way to come back on because he still had all his tokens in his hand. He just, where does he come in at? And we couldn't figure it out. Well, there's a fairly infamous story about Warhammer 40K, which of course is the tabletop miniature game, where uh, one guy, they were these two guys were going to play at a tournament, and one guy had an army that was infiltrating onto the board, and another guy had an army he wanted to keep all in reserve. So the guy who looked at the other guy, you know, said, "I'm going to keep my entire army in reserve, and therefore I will have to deploy <laughs> from the table edge." Have you heard of this one? I, I, yeah, and there's an infamous picture of. This, yes, I've yeah. seen it. Yeah. yeah. So the other, so the other guy said, okay. And because his army could infiltrate, that means they could set up anywhere as long as they were further, you know, further than a certain amount away from an enemy model. No enemy models on the table. Therefore, he covered every single inch of his opponent's table edge and his opponent could not, in fact, deploy ever. Because <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, holding in reserve was a kind of a cheesy tactic that had been no, making no, no, the no, rounds no. at the there's time. There's absolutely nothing wrong with holding your army in reserve. Well, I meant the it whole was... thing. He was holding the whole thing in reserve, not just some units or something. Well, like yeah, that. but there's, but again, that's a perfectly legitimate tactic. It was just unfortunate that he chose to use it in this particular case <laughs> because it meant that he he didn't even get to play the game at all. <laughs> so there you go. So what have you been playing lately, Daryl? I haven't been doing much playing, just I finally got my Hero Labs set up and all pretty fied. Thank you very much, Lone Wolf Development, for helping me with that. Because they're our sponsor on the game table, the Shadowrun actual play podcast that we do. And they provided me with a copy of the Hero Labs software to create the characters in. And I loved it so much. And I'm like, uh, and then Ross is helping me remake my character Babysitter. And I, he had these awesome guns that were in one of the source books. I'm like, screw it. I'm going to buy it. It's only 10 bucks. Went and bought it and I bought the wrong damn package. So I emailed them on Friday and today it's like, okay, here you go. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Here you go. Here's the new one. Don't worry about the other one. Keep it. So that nice. was really awesome. Great customer Good service customer from them. customer service. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it, w- it would have been nice if I had it in time for the game then, but I can understand because, you know, time differences and I emailed them in the afternoon on Friday. So, right. so my fault on that one. And it was my mistake in the first place, picking the wrong package. So, but yeah, I got that set up and I've also been plotting with a friend of mine for his, uh, that second edition D and D game that he's running. Apparently they're trying to kill a spider Lord or something. It's like a seven foot tall giant spider. And they're, they were first level when they first, or sorry, second level when they first ran across it. So they've been running guerrilla tactics in, in, in one battle against the little spider minions they got enough XP to go up two levels. Wow. Or, or at least he did. He was He's playing a thief in second edition. Not exactly hard to go up levels. That's true. 
And right, and so right now they're trying to work on a final plan. So I was helping him with his battle plan involved, uh, a barrel half full of lamp oil and half full of lard to dump into this cave that's just <laughs> filled with spider webs. And he, he was thinking about doing these little clay pots to make a Molotov cocktail. I'm like, no, no, no. What you do is you dump it in and let it coat the bottom. Use the clay pots to coat the walls. Then you like the spider webs. Cause if you like the spider webs, all the spiders are going to be scurrying to the walls and then the, or jumping down into the ground, which these spider webs are then going to light on fire and burn slower. He's following the old adage, plan B is just plan A with more fire. Exactly. <laughs> okay. And I, I just really like the idea he came up with half uh, lamp oil, half lard, let it burn longer and slower. Because nothing, nothing says I love you like a bunch of hot pig fat that is now on fire. Yep. <laughs> so okay. that's what I've been doing gaming related. Uh, well, I want to do a quick shout out just to Daryl for recording all of our weekly episodes of Shadowrun on our actual play Gamers Podcast, Gamers Tavern Podcast. Uh, it's called uh, Gamers Gamers Tavern Game Tavern Table. Game Table, and I was getting to that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's all right. Uh, that's why Daryl's here; is he makes sure I st- I stay on task. Um, but he he's doing a great job of recording that. We've been playing that every week. It's uh it's been really fun. Although uh we've been kind of working our way through some pacing issues in that group, but I think we're we're coming along really well. Also in favor of Hero Lab, um my Torg group, which is now doing it as Savage Worlds Torg, <laughs> we remade all our characters using the Hero Lab software this weekend, and it was much easier and much quicker. And uh, I will forevermore be a fan of, of Hero Lab, which I already was from its shot run purposes. But Hero Lab, <laughs> Hero Lab makes Savage Worlds easier, too, which is great. Actually, tomorrow, like w- by the time this podcast launches, I will have been playing for a while. But tomorrow is going to launch our uh, Avengers Next Generation game. So I'm excited about that. Which character are you? This is a game set in the uh, – so if you take the 1980s Avengers, the Steranko era – and you push it about 20 years in the future, and it's all their sons and daughters. So we got, like, you know, the daughter of Miss Marvel is one of the guys. I am playing Valkyrie 2, who is the daughter of Fandral the Dashing of the Warriors 3, and Brunhilde, the Valkyrie of the Defenders of that era. So not exactly super related to the Avengers, but the DM really loves the Warriors 3, so any excuse to bring them in is good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so last thing, f- before we jump into our big topic, Jamie... We like to ask, what is your most memorable die roll? Now, obviously, it's going to have a slight difference uh, in a board game, but I'm sure it, <laughs> you will have some good stories about a memorable die roll. So hit us hit us with your best one. Well, I, I the game I designed, Euphoria, has a lot of those. Like, you know, I played it so many times, and it's a dice worker placement game, so it has a lot of those. But I, I, I've been thinking about this question all day, and I have one from this recent game that I mentioned called Kemet that I want to mention and then bring up a question for you two to see what you okay. think. Basically, I was I, I got Kemet about a month ago, and I played it a lot. And every time I played, I've taught at least two people how to play. I don't think I played with any group yet where everyone knows how to play, and we just go all out. But in one of the games that I played, about 20 minutes into the game, I could have won the game, which is very fast. This is a 60 to 90 minute, 90 minute game, but no one else knew what they were doing. And so I had gotten seven points. I needed one more point to win. And there was a certain thing that I could have bought to just end the game right there and call it, call it a victory. And probably not a night. We probably would have played another game. And so I, I, I've had this, this kind of memorable moment in my, in my head since then. And I wanted to kind of turn it around to you guys to say, to ask you, when you're playing a game, when you're teaching some people a game where they don't know how to play, but everyone is still motivated to win... Have you ever encountered a moment like that? Or if you do encounter moments like that where you could win, what do you do? Do you do you not win just so you can prolong the game and, and continue to help teach everyone how to play? Or do you just call it a victory and maybe play again? I am fortunate in that about 50 to 75% of the time when I'm teaching new players a board game, either beginner's luck or they just take to it like a duck to water. And they start whooping my ass. <laughs> okay. Even if I try my hardest, they just start beating the crap on me. And it may be me splitting my attention between answering the person's question next to me while something else is going on, on the table and I miss something because I'm not fully focused on it. But still, either way, I usually don't have that problem. The few times I do, I always try to play at a level that is a challenge to the new players without overwhelming them. Right. I want to be, I want them to enjoy the game. I want them to learn the game. I want them to like the game and just completely curb stomping them 
is not going to leave a good taste in their mouth right? for the first time they play the game. So I'd rather play with the kid gloves on and lose the first game, but get to play 10, 15, 20 times more with them than to just completely, yeah, I kicked your ass. <laughs> we'll play, you want to play again? <laughs> no, screw you, man. In your face, second grader. <laughs> <laughs> when I should note that I, I was not trying to stomp everyone. Th- this is a game where you're, like I said, you're incentivized to attack other players. And so I was kind of trying to show everybody, this is how you play. You can't just sit back right. and be defensive in this game. This is how you score points. So I was showing them by example. Well, if I yeah. could answer that question. Yeah, what about, really what about you, Ross? When I was working at Fantasy Flight Games, uh, one of the guys who would teach games to us was a, a fellow by the name of Rob Kuba, one of our designers there. You may know him. You may not. I've heard the name, yeah. So Rob, Rob is a great guy. I really, really like Rob. He's a, he's, he's a very nice fellow. But Rob, his style of teaching was that the burned hand teaches best. <laughs> <laughs> so for Rob Kuba, Rob would say, of course, I would take every opportunity for victory because that's how I am showing him how to win the game. That would be the Rob Kuba style. Mm. What about you? Personally, for me, I – have never enjoyed that particular approach when it's used on me. <laughs> uh, so I, I like to, there, I, okay, there actually, there was a, a, a thing on, um, cracked recently about the unwritten rules of games recently. And one of the things I thought was really interesting about that is they make a point of showing that there is kind of an unwritten rule that if someone is still learning the game, you don't just absolutely crush them because the point of teaching someone the game is so that they will play it with you. And Therefore, you want them to have fun, and sometimes that means dialing it back a little bit. <laughs> right. I, I like where Daryl actually said, where he's like, I, you know, I give them a level of challenge without overwhelming them. I think that's actually a really good way to go, especially during that unwritten rule training period. I think that's my philosophy as well, is I would, I would want to give them a fun and challenging game without just overwhelming them. I think that makes sense. Yeah. And that's essentially what ended up happening. I, I, I didn't buy the tile. The game went on for probably another almost two hours, ended up being a long game. And I think everyone had a much better time than if I had just won the game outright at that point. And I ended up losing the game in the end. Yeah, but I think for – this is this is just you know my particular take on it. But uh, when you're teaching a game, the purpose or the uh, the end goal is not necessarily victory. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> what, what I probably would have done in your shoes, Jamie, in that case is I would have said, okay, guys, just so you can know what's going on, if I do this right now, this would mean I would have my eighth point and I would win. So right. that way you guys can see what happens at the end game. This is what would happen. Now, this is what I'm going to do instead so we can keep going. Right. Yeah, yeah that's not that's not a bad way to do it either. But I like that. So that way they don't think that you didn't do it for some rule-related purpose. Because I've seen people basically make up a rule in their head. Well, why didn't he do that? There must be something that says he can't do that. Right. So that must be the rule. And so they make up a rule in their head that doesn't exist. Right. Well, and this is, I'm going to turn this question back around to Jamie a little bit too. Um, you know how they say that doctors make the worst patients? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever, have you ever played a board game with other game designers? I, I have, let's see. I'm trying to think of a specific <laughs> example. Yeah, I have. I played have, other I played their games, like, with other designers. I was just curious if you've ever run into that in that particular adage in, in the terms of uh, the board game area. Like, were other designers – how so? Well, the, the saying that doctors make the worst patients is because they often think that they know what is best for right. their own care. When you take that into playing a game with other game designers, it is not always true, but I have certainly seen it where they will kind of spend more time – you know, wondering whether this mechanic is the right way to do it or not, you know, right. than actually playing sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely encounter that with design. I, I probably do it myself. But but usually when I play games, I mean, the, I just want everyone to have a good time. Right. Uh, whether I win or lose doesn't really matter all that much. And particularly, like you guys said, when I am teaching my own games to, to other people or games that I've acquired that I want other people to like, winning the game is not the victory. Or it's right. not the goal. So speaking of goals, why don't we start talking about crowdfunding? <laughs> cool. Yeah. You see how I did that? Just smooth segue smooth that one. Nice smooth segue. on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's your best one yet, man. Probably. Probably. I'm working on it, you know, every time. <laughs> Practice makes perfect. So let's throw this question to Jamie because I think he's probably a good guy to help us kind of get into this. What is crowdfunding? 
I guess the overarching term refers to tapping into people other than yourself, generally strangers, to to build something together, to to fund something together, to to gen- generate ideas together. I think all those components go into crowdfunding, the the concept of crowdfunding. And in particular, the the system that you and I have used is Kickstarter, which is, I would say, the most well-known crowdfunding platform where creators, pretty much anybody can put a project, something they want to create on the site and try to raise enough money, a certain amount of money to, to actually build that thing or make that thing. And if you don't raise that much money on some sites, at least Kickstarter, if you don't hit your funding goal, then no one pays anything and you don't get any money. So it's kind of low risk for the creators. Low risk for the creators, yeah, and and low risk for the backers themselves, yeah. So what are some things that Kickstarter – I mean this is probably a very revealing question, but in your opinion, what are some things that Kickstarter and other crowdfunding platforms are not? Kickstarter is not an equity platform. So if you are a backer and you, you're giving money to a creator on Kickstarter, you are not uh, gaining a share of the company or a portion of the company. It's also not a pre-order platform, even though it may often look that way and sometimes creators use it that way. But Kickstarter is intended to be a platform uh, where you you are usually raising money to produce something that, that maybe everyone gets who helps the project. But it's it's not a store, I guess. It's not a, a, a store where something is definitely going to be made the exact way that you've already made it and everyone's going to get that thing. Because there's a couple of companies that uh, will go nameless in the role-playing game industry who are notorious for about every two, three months launching a new Kickstarter for a brand new product. Uh-huh. So they're basically using this as crowdfunding the pre-order. Basically, they're treating it like pre-orders. Order this, and you can make, get this book for free on PDF that we've already done. And it's a way for them to raise money so they don't have to have capital on hand every time they want to do a new print run or print a new book or create a new system. And that's right. and that's something that some companies are doing, and it's giving that interpretation that it's a way to pre-order games. And I'm a little bit guilty of this in the way I cover them for Ain't It Cool News as well. I kind of point – because every single time I point out, if you pledge at this level, your reward is the core game. Now, Jamie, now your, your company is Stonemeyer. Right. It is. It was founded on the the profits of the the products that you did eventually Kickstarter. Is that correct? Well, not founded on the profits. It it it's founded more so on the uh, on the retail profits. So we like with right, the retail we, profits. The yeah. retail That's profits. Yeah. At. Okay. So so what I'm getting at, I want to be what I want to make clear to people is that like Jamie was able to start a company thanks to his some of you know somewhat in thanks to his success on Kickstarter but the money that people put in to back his products is not the money that he used to make his company that it's the money that he got from selling the things that Kickstarter helped him make exactly that's yeah. the key difference here right so like with a when you're making a board game you have to have a, a minimum print run of usually a thousand or fifteen hundred copies so right. a lot of people turn to Kickstarter so they can um, at least get up to, you know, close to that. And then the extra copies they make, they sell to retailers. And that's what I use. The, the profits from those retail games are what I use to run the company. Can you tell us about what, why would you use crowdfunding? What's what's the real benefits of using crowdfunding? Well, I, I foresee a, a lot of benefits, especially in the board game space. But I can, I can see it in the RPG space and other, other categories as well. A, a big part of it for me is engaging people around the world who otherwise would not know who I am or or know who anyone really is on on Kickstarter. A lot of people kind of gravitate towards Kickstarter or gravitate towards Kickstarter projects because they want to be a part of uh, building something new and innovative. And I really love like the, I I love the ideas generated, the energy generated by that and the, the engagement generated by all those people. Did you experience that with your campaign? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the great things about Kickstarter is it, it really raises awareness. Yeah, I think it's it's a huge boost in just people knowing who you are, what you're making, and what it's all about. And it kind of when you put a project on Kickstarter, you're kind of showing people, both people you know and strangers, that you're that you're pretty serious about making whatever this thing is. I'm sure all of us have had ideas where we kind of tell people, "Yeah, I'm working on this idea. Like, I'm hoping to do this." But it's it's kind of more official when you actually put it on Kickstarter and, and make it look good. 
Now, what is um, – so you've described some of the benefits of, of Kickstarter for a producer or uh, someone who's actually making a, a product. Yeah. What's the, what's the benefit of a crowdfunding for consumers? I think for consumer, and I'm an avid Kickstarter backer, so I, I definitely fall into that category where I get really excited to help someone else create something that they're really passionate about. With the caveat, and this kind of goes back to your question of what Kickstarter is not, Kickstarter is not a charity, and I, I don't support projects that treat it that way. I, I support projects where I'm going to get a, a reward at a fair price in return, and for which I'm really excited about the reward. So as a backer, that's what I get excited about. I, I get excited about the, both the, the passion and whatever innovative game or product that the, uh, that the creator is trying to make. It's always kind of reminded me of those old PBS pledge drives they used to do back mm-hmm. when I actually watched TV. But uh, they would always, about once every couple months, they would interrupt Red Dwarf and put it delayed off, delayed on the air so they could run this. If you donate $35, you will get this lovely tote oh, bag. PBS. Yeah, yeah PBS the PBS. used to do those, those fundraisers a yeah, lot. That's, yeah, that's what I was – yeah, all those – NPR does the same thing on the radio. A lot of independent radio networks do that. I think uh, the Pacifica network of radio stations, independent network, does those as well, uh, where it's – they'll do these pledge drives where if you – pledge x amount you get this reward and usually the rewards are donated by a company for promotional reasons or whatever so they'll be you're basically paying paying retail price but the charity gets because these are basically publicly funded networks they're not corporations or charities i'm just going to take a couple of minutes to talk about some of the 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 projects that i've backed and and my experience with it i backed two rpg products from blackworm games on indiegogo and both of those were by people who were friends of mine. Uh, one was actually a former roommate and one was former uh, guy in my gaming group. So uh, it, it, I probably would have backed them no matter where they were, Indiegogo or not. But those products were, you know, it was okay. Um, I, I got what I was promised, although it kind of took me like chasing some things down here and there to, to make it happen. Because <laughs> uh, I asked for like signed copies and a specific size of a t-shirt. You know, I, I wasn't like the easiest guy in the world. But I was I was definitely satisfied with the, the stuff at the end. And of late, I would say there's two that I just want to say are fantastic as far as like a consumer, you know, contributing. There was the complete Larry Elmore, which I backed. And Larry Elmore, of course, is the kind of godfather of all fantasy artwork for RPGs. Mm -hmm. And he did this book that was like every color piece he'd ever done ever. And the guy has a really long, long career. Yeah. (laughs) So for like 25 bucks, I ended up getting this beautiful, gorgeous, huge book full of all these beautiful prints, and I just could not have been happier. It was just like I show it off to everybody who comes to my house. You've got to see the complete Larry Elmore. And then the other uh, the other success story I would I want to name check is, uh, of course, Shadowrun Returns, which was the RPG, uh, the video game RPG created by Jordan Wiseman and the guys over at Harebrained. There's actually been a um, an expansion for that just came out, which is called Dragonfall, and it is absolutely brilliant. It's it's up there with some of the best RPGs I have ever played on my computer. I, I think Kickstarter has been extremely good to me as a consumer. Uh, but that being said, I'm you know there's there's quite a few things that I have passed on and looked at and said no, I don't think that's right for me. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's maybe that's a good question for Jamie. You know, what is some what are some things that make a, a Kickstarter really good and really enticing and really makes you want to be a part of it? Well, whenever I, I visit a Kickstarter project page, I always look for a few things. I would say almost right away I look for art, art and design. Um, if it jumps out to me, if it's, if, that, if it's visually compelling, then that's going to draw me in. I usually look to see if the creator of the project has backed other projects. That usually won't – that – won't sway me either way but it does it it does make a small impact on me i like to see that someone um a is at least somewhat involved in other projects that they're not completely i guess self-centered that they they're they're looking to other people and to help other people as well and that they've learned from other projects that they've backed um i look for a lot of backer engagement uh, usually in the comments section and i think when it comes down to it if i'm actually going to give them my money, I look for a fair price and something that I actually think I'll use. Um, I usually won't just 
give money as as a token uh, if I don't think I'll I'll use whatever they're talking about. Yeah, I'm actually on the other side of the fence on that one. I almost everything I bought, I never got anything that I probably wouldn't have gotten for free anyway. Um, really? Yeah, I backed uh, Standard Action Season Three with a. La- I think it's last week's guests or possibly next week's guests. I may shuffle these episodes around a little bit, but uh, uh, Joanna Gaskell was on our show. Uh, I, I backed hers. I backed uh, Dungeon Bastards World's Worst Dungeon Crawl. I uh, got a video out of that. Um, I backed uh, Harry Knoll's Kickstarter because, well, he's kind of my boss's boss, so I kind of have to. <laughs> uh, I backed the Prismatic Art Collection, which was a collection to get uh, more racially diverse and gender diverse uh, character art that's going to be released to Creative Commons anyway. So these yeah, are things I backed. I backed just because I believe in them. I believed in the projects. I didn't back them in huge giant amounts or anything. It was like 10, 10 bucks here, 20 bucks here, but I, yeah, I still backed them. I'm with Daryl on that. I signed, I, I've backed a couple projects that I would have either gotten on anyway or just because I, they, they, I felt they deserved some extra cash. But now one thing you said that was really interesting to me, uh, you said it, you look for something that's very visually interesting that grabs you on a, on a visual level. Yeah. Yeah. Like artwork specifically. Right. Uh, I recently actually uh, got contacted by a friend of mine. He said, "Can you can you help my friend? He's trying to uh, crowdfund his novel." And I said, "Sure." And I you know took a look at what he was doing, and I went back to the guy and I said, uh, "You know, it says here you you're going for an illustrated book." He says, "Yeah, I've got a friend who's an artist. She's doing the cover and twenty interior color pieces, mm-hmm. uh, some of which are which are paintings." And I'm like, "Well, a number one, you don't actually say that." Uh, <laughs> on your Kickstarter, your, your page, which is kind of a problem. But a number two, your, your page displays none of this artwork. And I really, you know, th- I think that's what's going to grab me with, with this project is, is, uh, if, if she's really good, you know, let's see, let's see this artwork. Bring it up. Have you, uh, have you ever seen the, the accursed, uh, Kickstarter, Jamie? Yeah. I, lo- I looked at it before our podcast today. D- would you say that that's visually exciting? Absolutely. Yeah. That's what sucked me in back when I got the email. <laughs> about yeah. So we it were, was... we were very proud of the, you know, we were able to put some artwork up there that grabs you and pulls you right in, even without us saying anything about it. It was that artwork. Um, so I, I'm going to kind of continue. If people ask me for, for more advice on, on, uh, crowdfunding, I think that's one thing I'm always going to go back to is say, you know, you need something visually exciting there. Part of the, the, the trick is that, cause I see a lot of board game campaigns that have art. But whether or not it's good art can really hurt the project if it doesn't have good art. And I think it's tough as a project creator, and this probably applies to the RPG space too, you don't always, you don't always know if your art is actually good. So you have to ask people, you have to actually listen to what people are saying about the art. If multiple people are saying, hey, you know, it's not, it's not all that good, or if they're not raving about how good it is, you kind of have to pay attention to that. Um, I'm sure you. I'm sure you guys have seen projects on, on Kickstarter where maybe it sounded like a really cool concept, but the art just really wasn't good, and the creators seemed to have no idea that it wasn't good. Exactly. And I, another thing I see a lot of because I've never done a Kickstarter, but ever since I've been doing the Anical News column, every single column I pick three to five Kickstarters that are going on that I kind of say the these are things you should look at. So I've gotten mm-hmm. kind of a keen. I've kind of developed an eye to see which ones look like they're going to make it, which ones aren't, which ones that look like they're, even if it's a cool concept, it's something's off. Or if it's, if it looks like it's, these guys really, really are going to try hard, but they just need the capital. You can start seeing those things. Right. And one thing I see a lot is artwork that doesn't fit the tone of the game. Yeah. Well, let me ask you another question. Like you just, we, we brought up something there, uh, reasonable goals. Right. Right. Like, are you talking about the, the amount of funding that they're, they're looking for? Or are you talking about the end game of their, you know, this is what we're going to make? Is it kind of both? It's a little bit of both. And when I talk about the money, I talk about, uh, I'm talking about, uh, the, the price of the reward levels. Like if, if someone's, Offering me a, a t-shirt for thirty five dollars, I I know that a t-shirt doesn't cost anywhere close to thirty five dollars. I, I don't feel like I'm getting a return on my my investment there. But yeah, the same thing goes with the funding goal. If someone has a completely outrageous funding goal, usually that that will signal something to me. Not necessarily that they're that they don't know what they're doing, but maybe that they haven't completely run through the budget properly to see how much everything will actually cost. 
Well, that's a you know that's an interesting question. Can you? I mean, obviously, it's going to depend on a lot of factors, right? Yeah. I'm just going to ask you for like a ballpark figure for let's say I don't know a board game. Like if you were going to look at a Kickstarter board game, what would be a ballpark figure that you would say above this number and it's probably unreasonable for a uh, funding goal or a reward level price? Fun, let's say funding goal. For funding goal, if I see something with usually higher than fifty thousand, then I'm a little hesitant. Now I have seen games that have. 50,000 or more and and they're clearly very competent in other areas and maybe they just they decided that was that needed to be their goal but Hair, Hairbrain schemes um Gollum Arcana was a I think it was a 100 that's a hybrid board game slash app uh, yeah app, wasn't that uh, 300,000 what was their goal I think it was like 120 let's see it was pretty high uh yeah their goal was uh half a million Half a million, yeah. Which they, which they did raise, but again, this is a established company that was taking a big risk with a big product, pre-painted minis with RFID chips that you know, and a Bluetooth wand and an app that's cross-platform. Right. Well, I think part of it is just me as a human being seeing a, a, a project that say say their goal is fifty thousand and they've raised five thousand by the time I discover it. Like I, I kind of wonder, like, is it even worth putting the money into it, even if the money doesn't get exchanged? Like, are you guys, are you more likely to back a funded project or an unfunded project, a project that is yet to fund? Well, I'm with you. I mean, I, I look at the the amount they're asking for, and I have seen some that I'm like, they are never going to reach that. Yeah, <laughs> I have. I have also been surprised by some where I'm like, they are never going to reach that, and then they totally did. Uh-huh. So, <laughs> you know, I, I have to admit though that that is one thing I do look at when I want to back a product is uh, is it does it seem like something achievable to me? Yeah. And it, that's one thing you can see a lot of. It's either people overestimating or underestimating the goal. So if I see a a game that's essentially a deck of cards, even if it's just a card laying game and it has little meeples in it, maybe. But if it's just literally a deck of cards and they're asking for like fifty or seventy five thousand, they've way overshot what they're they're either thinking they're going to push like Mayfair Games level product or Fantasy Flight level numbers right. on their independent game. Or they have gotten way overbid on, they got a really high estimate on printing. And right. then you see ones that have these, compo- that are like miniature games, pretty much, where it's board games. We're good. We're going to have 24 miniatures and plastic and resin and, and movable tiles and this component and that component. And our goal is 5,000. There is right. no way in hell you're right. getting miniatures for 5,000. Someone lied to you somewhere. Well, there was a fairly famous one recently uh, that was headlined by Rick Priestley, who's a guy who's really well known as a very good designer of miniature games. He's kind of like the king of, of designing miniature games. And he ran one called Beyond the Gates of Antares. Now, the, the stated goal uh, was he wanted to make enough money to start a new miniature games company because he had retired from Games Workshop. Mm-hmm. And he was asking for three hundred thousand pounds. <laughs> wow, that is about that's about four hundred and fifty thousand dollars U.S. Give or take. Yeah. How did he do? Um. Well, he got about two thirds of the way there and then canceled it. Yeah, the the Kickstarter is currently showing as he got a hundred thousand five hundred fifty three pounds and it was canceled on the thirteenth, even though it was scheduled to run until doesn't say anymore. Yeah, he had more than two weeks left on the clock. I think what had happened there was at least certainly for me was you know three hundred thousand pounds. You're got to be kidding me. You know, right. <laughs> I looked at that and I think that that's you know probably one of those examples of just like someone aiming way too high. Yeah. Now, not that I have anything against Rick Priestley. He's, he's a, as I said, a very talented, very, very good game designer. And, you know, I love a lot of stuff he's worked on. But I think, yeah, maybe maybe in this particular case, it was just you know, aiming a little too high. He was trying to start a bit too, but he was trying to maybe restart Games Workshop. He's used to those <laughs> level of resources and thought <laughs> maybe, he needed to have uh, that big of a print run I, to actually know, launch. I, I will not say anything about any potential, you know, link between, you know, overestimating and Games Workshop. Uh, <laughs> I will in, not insi- insider knowledge, so yeah, I, will I understand. Not. But, but that, that's yes. from an outsider looking in. That's what it looks like to me. It's like, oh, hey, this is what this is. How many units I need to right. make to make this work? And he way overestimated what he needed. So huge, giant goal that just wasn't going to work, it, even with his name. Because I know Games Workshop. I know Warhammer 40k. I know I've heard that name before, 
but I couldn't tell you it right now if you held a gun to my head. Rick something. Priestley. Okay. So, <laughs> well, anyway, the point is, is that that was probably too high. Now, we had, Jamie, I, I had asked you earlier, you know, what makes a number too high when it comes to the the funding level. What about on the rewards level? Because I think that was the other side you said. Right. And I think that partially depends on the type of game. So if it's a, a pretty basic card game, I'll usually look for a price in the range of 15 to $20. Because, I, you know, usually U.S. shipping is included in that price. So I, I try to take that into account. I understand they have to ship it to me as well. For a, a heavier game with a lot of wooden components and a lot of cards, tiles, a game board that I'm usually looking somewhere in the 35 to 50 range. And I think like mi- people who buy miniatures games are typically used to spending a lot more than that, somewhere between 75, 100, even much higher on some projects. The, I what, backed, what was a cool mini or not? Was 150, I think, or 100 one, for Zombicide? I think it was 100 for Zombicide, but then you could add more miniatures for, yeah. for higher prices. And I don't usually get up into that level of uh, games. Some people are comfortable <laughs> right. spending that mu- much, but I'm, I'm not. Now, I think another good thing that we could point out, point to and say, you know, this makes a, this, this Kickstarter is good because it's that focus on the core product. Yeah. It was like I was telling my friend, you know, he was saying, you know, my, I've, I'm writing a book and, and I have artwork in it. And, and, and my point to him was, you didn't say that on the front page. I, I think a lot of Kickstarters that I've looked at and that I have thought were well done and well constructed have that little elevator pitch right at the top. They have, you know, a, an expanded section where they tell you exactly what they're doing and exactly what you're going to get. And they don't kind of wander off into, you know, crazy left field land unless they get just, you know, their, their stretch goals just get like way out of control. But uh, for the most part, they stay true to what they were, you know, aiming for. Would you right. say that's also a, a good thing? Oh, that's that's a huge thing. Yeah, I, I admire that both as a backer and a creator. Because usually if I back a project, or especially a game project, all I want is for them to make a great game and deliver it to me at some point in the future. I don't want them spending their time making, like, sending out t-shirts or or working on ancillary materials. I just want a great game. And I think that's usually the case with with most kickstarters where you you just if if someone's really passionate about making one specific thing, that's what you're backing. That's what you get passionate about as a backer. One thing I see a lot on these kickstarter games is they will say, "Okay, here's our core board game for this much." And if you jump to this level, you get our first expansion. You jump to this level, you get our second expansion. You jump mm-hmm. to this level, you get our novel. You jump to this one, you get our campaign setting for for Savage Worlds or OGL or Pathfinder. And I'm like, "Dude, one thing, get your board game done. Maybe an expansion. You've got stretch goals. Don't try to do everything at once." And that's right. what I see a lot of them trying to do, spreading themselves thin. Well, here's here's I think where the lines get a little blurry is sometimes when a creator is launching a product, especially, and this was true about Accursed, is we were launching, you know, we were launching that as a world, right? It, it, the core thing was a setting book for Savage Worlds, absolutely. But when we were starting to de- develop, like, new things for it and what we were going to do for stretch goals and things like that, fiction seemed like a natural outreach of defining this world. Yes. <laughs> um, in fact, the guys on Shadow and Returns did that. They had an anthology of, of stories, which, you know, that's a video game and an RPG, which you would say is probably a little further than... Uh, that particular type of experience. But it's actually, I, I think they were both a natural fit for that particular Kickstarter. Um, so like I said, sometimes the lines can get a little blurry. I, I don't mind it if it's something I can in, at least, if I can at least draw a dotted line between, you know, the beginning and, and where we're going with it, right? If it, if it at least right. makes sense to like, okay, yeah, I see where, I see how that relates to what we're doing. I'm a little more forgiving. But the tie-in novel for a board game is something a little bit different. And another thing is, you guys... Well, you know, it depends. I mean, if it's if it's Zombicide, you know, I maybe, might want to yes. read the exploits something that's of those. got a very, very heavy theme, yeah. But if you're... I've seen them for... I've seen for literally abstract games where it's like, oh, we've got a... We're going to have a novel, too. And I'm like, dude, chill. But when, you say, when you're looking at a role-playing game, it's a lot easier to kind of spread out a little bit more. It's like, okay, here's our core book, and then here we've got these source books that we've already got lined up because... You guys are already going to have, okay, we've got these freelance writers on tap. We just have to write the checks and they'll get started. Well, maybe, okay, let, let's, let's postulate this as a theory. Maybe we're talking about focus and we're just saying that as long as the, as long as the things are still, you know, somewhat in focus, maybe they're not quite blurry. <laughs> yeah. 
it makes sense. But the further out we get, the more blurry they are in terms of that focus. And we, it just, you, you lose interest because it's not part of that focus. And one thing that Accursed did very well is they main, you guys maintained that focus when you did. It was, here's our core thing. Here's the other things that we've got that we're going to launch with. Now, when we hit stretch goals, that's when we're going to start doing some other things. And people are more forgiving for stretch goals. I found that to be true. Yeah. But if you're trying to sell me on the core game and the first three expansions right out the gate, that's a different story. Save save some of that stuff for stretch goals. If you've got the stretch goals, that means you're going to have the capital to be able to do these things. Well, I think one variation of that, too, is like, Ross, you have... You have a cursed and you have the Savage Worlds, but if I don't know if you do, you have another product line that's completely separate than that. Uh, well, the company John's company does Miller Vio. He's got the uh, Hope Preparatory School, which is sort of superheroes in high school kind of approach. And we did offer some of that on, on the uh, pledge levels, but only if you didn't like anything that we were offering. It was like, we're, we will give you one PDF of everything we do for Accursed, but if you don't really like what we do for Accursed, you can have this other stuff instead. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Which I didn't think was a bad idea. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence about that, because I, I see that with board game companies a lot, too, where they offer either an expansion or a, a game in a certain product line, and then they'll have a higher reward level where they'll mm-hmm. offer two or three other games with it too. But I find as a backer, usually I go to that project and I'm going to back that project because I'm interested in what that project is offering, like that specific, what they're raising money for, for that, that game, not their other products. Yeah. I I I follow you. You're making a lot of sense there, but in this case it was like, well, I'm I'm not going to defend it. I mean, we, (laughs) I I think, I think everyone knows where we were going with that and and it did well. So there's not much we need to say about that, but you've got a good point (laughs) and I definitely see where you're coming from. Drive Through RPG is the place to go to purchase digital copies of your favorite games: Dungeons and Dragons, Shadowrun, World of Darkness, Savage Worlds, Numenera, Fate, and so many more. Do you long for the feel of actual paper in your hands? Well, they sell physical products too. Just go to GamersTavern.org and click on the link in the show notes to find your favorite games and support the podcast with every purchase. And we are joined here on episode 25 by another guest, uh, Mac Martin of Weird Games. Salutations. Uh, Thanks for joining us tonight, Mac. Our subject happens to be crowdfunding, and that's something that you, of course, know something about. Why don't you tell our listeners what you know about crowdfunding, or at least some of the projects that you've been involved in that that have uh, taken advantage of it? Well, I've really, I've been in two um, that have uh, really taken advantage of it. In this case, Evil Baby Orphanage, which was our first kind of toe in the water, does crowdfunding work for us? And we found that, oh, it does. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's amazing as a company to not have to be beholden to a bank uh, because it allows you to really focus on providing the product the company wants for its customers and not having to worry about providing a product in, in as strict a timeline and that's you know just there to make as much money for you know across the board. It allows you to pinpoint your audience. And then my second one uh, was uh, Through the Breach, which we also learned a lot on. One, uh, we learned to do much shorter Kickstarters that uh, 40 or 30 to 45 days is much too long. And that, you know, you have to have, when if, with the projects big enough, you need to be ready to show a lot more stuff and really, you know, interact with the community a lot more aggressively. Now, Through the Breach was a very big Kickstarter that actually raised over a quarter of a million dollars uh, under about two hundred and thirty four thousand. OK, well, really close. <laughs> so that was not small at all. No. And then uh, Evil Baby Orphanage broke one hundred thousand, which really surprised us. Yeah. So but good job for small on both of those. So something you said that was really interesting was about the length of the campaign. And uh, we did a 30 day on Accursed. Uh, Jamie, how long have your Kickstarters been? Uh, Viticulture was 37 or 38 days, maybe even 40. And then Euphoria was 28 days. I usually recommend to new creators that they they go with a longer campaign because they're going to learn a lot throughout that campaign, but that for for return creators that you don't go over 30. That's a really good point. So if you were to run another Kickstarter, how long would you let it go? Well, I have uh, have the one I'm launching tomorrow, and that's... (laughs) Both of you? Is there another one launching tomorrow? Oh, uh, I, thought, I thought Mac was said that. I'm sorry. 
No, no. I have one. Uh, well, I don't have one. We are working with a company called Octopus 8. I'm not involved with the project. Uh, we're doing a car- uh, Weird is doing a card game and providing some miniatures for a company that is uh, doing a video game that's going to launch next week. And it's a, cro- it's a crossover video game card game. So you can, you, know, oh. you can play the video game on your smartphone, but then when you're playing the card game, you can use your phone in the card game. At least that's what I've been told. I'm not involved really closely with it, but my company is, is helping a uh, – is kind of partnering with another company. All right, so how long is this new one going to be, Jamie? This one will run from tomorrow until April 9th. So I, I think that's either 20 or 7 or 20, 28 days. 28 days. And it's not a zombie game. It's not, no. <laughs> it's not Cthulhu and it's not zombie. No. And it's Thank not, it's, you! It's, and it's not recovering from uh, being a, a, an alcoholic either, well, which is a shame. So you're, <laughs> so you're saying you don't like my C- Cthulhu versus the zombies idea? Oh no, no. no! I'm saying if you run it for 28 days, you you know you ought to have at least zombies or Sandra Bullock. <laughs> um, I'll back anyway. anything with Sandra Bullock. I got you, I'm with you there. <laughs> I remember someone telling me they actually thought that 28 days later was a sequel to the Sandra Bullock movie when they went in. Uh, that would be me. It was you. Yes, that would be me. <laughs> so no, but that's that's a really good point about the length of it. Now, what's interesting, I'm actually in the early stages of putting together Kickstarter myself with a good friend of mine to do the 40th anniversary edition of the Ardwin Grimoire. And one thing we've been talking about is you know how long we should let this Kickstarter run. Now, the uh, the accursed one we did was for 30 days, and it was it certainly felt like it was a little too long to me. <laughs> uh, the doldrums in between the, the the beginning and the end were always just nail biting, you know. So I was really kind of tempted and leaning towards uh, like a two week, like a oh. like a 14 day. What would be Jamie? What would you say to someone if they came to you and said, "I want to run a Kickstarter for you know two weeks as opposed to four? I've seen it done. Kickstarter to me, there's a lot of momentum that goes into um, overfunding, at least. And I think it's a, maybe a little hard to get momentum going with a two-week project because almost as soon as you started, it's going to be over. But, I mean, even for the one that I'm running right now, I was tempted to make it even shorter. Just the dates didn't exactly work out the way I wanted it to. I would probably go down to three weeks, maybe 20 days. And I will say something as someone who covers Kickstarters. It is always a rush against the clock against yeah. me finding out first i have to find out about your kickstarter then i have to say okay this looks cool then i have to put it in the column then i have to send it to my editor and wait for it to go up and there's not much point in putting it up in the column if there's only going to be a couple of hours left when it goes up so i'm so there's some solid arguments it. for longer than two weeks okay that's a that's a really important point see now i i took a different approach at least in my head um what i found is that the uh, most of your funding comes in the first three days and the last, and the three, last days. three days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, a, it's actually an inverse bell curve. Pretty right. Much. And yeah. we or at least in the future, if I'm going to run another one, I'm just going to make sure that I have articles prepared and that I'm, you know, I've got a lot of lead up to my Kickstarter. So the information gets out there about the start of it and all that kind of stuff, especially for the media outlets like blogs and podcasts and stuff so that they know ahead of time and can maybe even interview with me so they're ready to go during the Kickstarter. Yeah, it's all about scheduling is what you're saying. Yeah, today. I think there's a lot yeah. of scheduling and you got to prep with the community. Okay. Well, that's all. those are all excellent points and um, I'm really glad we, we got you on the podcast to talk about that today, Mac. We've talked about, you know, what, what makes a good Kickstarter. Let's spend a few minutes talking about managing a Kickstarter. Now, Jamie, your board games, those are physical products, right? That's right. Yeah. So there's some challenges inherent in doing a Kickstarter that is all about physical rewards. Oh, absolutely. So why yeah. don't we talk a little? What, what are some of those challenges? Well, the the biggest challenge I think is shipping. When you run a Kickstarter that has a physical product, you you either have to find a company, a fulfillment company, that's going to take care of shipping for you, or you have to take care of it yourself. And I kind of do a, I do a hybrid of the two. I use Amazon fulfillment, so I'm managing the fulfillment process, but. The people at good people at Amazon are the ones who are actually packing it up and shipping it out and storing it in their warehouse and storing it in their warehouse. Yeah, so I try to help people understand that process so that they're not stuck with a thousand games to send out of their garage because a lot of things can go wrong if you do that. Yeah, absolutely. Now um, on Accursed, of course, we did it all digital, and mm-hmm. if you wanted a physical copy, you could uh, cash in a coupon on Drive Through RPG for a print on demand which was then fulfilled by drive through 
uh, which made us all very happy because then we didn't have to store books in our garage. <laughs> um, and it made our backers actually pretty happy for the most part because they were uh, able to get their digital reward right away. And if they wanted the physical one, they, they of course had to wait for it. But at least they had the product, you know, in electronic form between the, you know, the, the money coming out of their account and receiving it in the mail. Do you have any stats on how many people uh, use the drive through RPG versus just using the digital version? I don't write it at my fingertips, um, but I could probably find that out for you later. Yeah, I'm just I'm curious uh, if people because I, I don't know the RPG space all that much. Do people typically just use their their iPad and they flip through on there, or do they do people like to have that physical printed copy with the beautiful art? I think a lot of people like to have the physical copy, um, but you know that it would be really interesting to see that those numbers certainly. Yeah. I mean, I I always back for a physical copy of the core book for a role playing game. Uh-huh. And I will go for all digital source books and splat books and adventures and stuff like that. Okay. Because the core book, that's something that's going to sit at the table, passed around between players, flipped through all the time. It's a lot easier to have that physically on the table because everyone's going to need to reference it for the rules. Right. All the other stuff, I can sit there and thumb through it on my computer, on my, I, on my, uh, my Galaxy S4, on my Kindle. So Mac, let me ask you this question. What are some other potential pitfalls that you can run into for managing your Kickstarter? Well, I think they touched on the biggest one. Um, I mean, you couldn't see me because this is a podcast, but I was just vigorously nodding my head along with everything <laughs> they were just saying. Um, <clears throat> the biggest one is fulfillment, but that that goes even further, especially if you have multiple physical items. You need to yeah, know it's about how, production too, right? right? Yeah, you got to know your production schedule. You got to be able to get it all done. Um, for instance, through the breaches had. You know, it had some production issues. Now, luckily, that meant because we were trying to time everything to be printed at the same time, we just leveraged that, and I got extra playtesting time. You know, I got extra time with the game, which was always good. But at the same time, if I were, you know, with a less forgiving community, that would be very, very difficult. Um, and, I mean, we're still coming in pretty close to our I – mean, we pitched a, a September release date, and unfortunately, our manufacturing just – you know, we weren't able to get it out – and all in the uh, warehouse to ship out. And it's because shipping is so expensive and fulfillment is so expensive that that became an issue. We, you know, you, you can't send out one or two things at a time. You've got to send it all out together. And otherwise you're, you're bankrupting yourself. Right. Well, yeah. And, and I think one of the key bits there is of course, communicating with your, your backer so that they understand that you can't send things out piecemeal. You're also gonna always going to be that guy. He's like, well, why can't I get my book now? You know. Well, and there's always going to be, some, uh, you know, some people will always be upset by dis- by delays, and that is un- that is unfortunate because we don't want to upset our our customer base. Uh, you know, they, these are people who really believed in your product, and they're the last people you want to be upset with you because they're the ones that that showed you the most trust. Right. Well, Ross, I, I think you touched upon something there too with the the idea of communication with backers. I don't think I don't know of any Kickstarter project that has gone exactly as planned for the creator, and, <laughs> and, and I, th- despite their best intentions, their best planning, best budgeting, and so I really think the key for a lot of Kickstarters is just keeping people in the loop, both for purposes of transparency and trust, but also because many backers want to feel involved in that process. They want the sneak behind the curtain. They want to yeah, see yeah. how how it all works. I absolutely agree. Communication is a huge deal about how to manage your Kickstarter. You got to be on top of things. Let me chime in on that one. That one's a big thing that I've learned very heavily is that you need to also use Kickstarter itself to communicate. One of the things we tried to do with Through the Breach was to create a forum just for Through the Breach and just for the backers. And I was communicating very heavily there, but I didn't have access to, you know, directly to our Kickstarter. I couldn't post directly to it. I had to hand it off to someone else to post up. And what I found is even though I was communicating directly with them, giving them PDFs to play test, we, you know, me and the forum community were really working hard, and they were very much a part of making through the breach the game it is, like play testing and comments and just notes back. I mean, I, just tons of information from them back and forth. Not everyone did that, and there are people on the Kickstarter who were expecting much more communication from me directly, and right, right. I didn't have that avenue. And in the future, I think it's. It's really important to be very clear and to have one concise avenue of, of communication. That's a really good point. And actually, I think that'll move us on to another question for you guys. Whoever wants to answer first is fine. But what are some warning signs when you look at a Kickstarter and you're like, I don't know? I got one. 
that I go to every single time I analyze Kickstarter before I put it on any cool news. I will look at it. Okay, this concept looks neat. Before I watch the video, before I read it, before I check the rewards, I go down to the bottom of the page where it says risks and challenges. If I see, I've seen this several times. Well, we've already got the game designed and we got the art, so all we got to do is print it and ship it, so there shouldn't be any issues. <laughs> okay, that moment, no, I am not putting my reputation on the line by telling my readers to back this Kickstarter. I'm not telling them about it, and I'm going to kind of watch and laugh you cra- when you crash and burn. That's kind of mean to say, but that shows me, if you don't have a thought-out risks and challenges, if it doesn't look like you've actually thought of what could go wrong and put it in your Kickstarter that, okay, this is where something may go wrong. This is where we may have delays. This is where things may completely utterly break down. If I don't see that, I'm going to immediately think, okay, you haven't thought this through nearly as well as you should have before you launched. I want to see a good, intelligent, well thought out. This is what we thought about. This is how we're going to handle it. If it comes up, we're just making you aware of what our process is. I want to see that they've thought about it. They've, They've actually looked into it. I like that a lot. What about you, Mac? Well, again, I was nodding vigorously there. But uh, one of the other one of the other things I've noticed that can that can cause a lot of problems with the Kickstarter is too many options on the right side, uh, too mm-hmm. many pledge levels. A lot of times, if I see like two dozen pledge levels, I immediately know that there's something weird going on, and that I'm going to have to like really read through the whole Kickstarter to understand what they're trying to do. That usually, to me, is indicative of people who have a lot of hopes and dreams like and we'll do this and we'll do this and you can buy this and this extra and this add-on and all those things and not a lot of experience making it happen and that can often cause a lot of a lot of problems i mean anywhere like up to 10 is probably fine and of course everybody throws in a couple of big ticket items because that's fun but if they fifteen hundred dollars and you can play with us at gen con right things that are you know unlikely to probably get a big but you get that one whale that takes it yeah, that one guy who that for him is well worth the money, and you're like, great, yeah, come on down, let's incorporate that. But if you've got, if you've got too many of those levels and you've got just too many all throughout, it probably is indicative of of you trying to do more, biting off more than you. And I'm sure Jamie can back me up on this one. One thing I see a lot in board games is when they have those ten, twelve rewards. I can't tell what I need to buy just to get the damn game. Oh, that is a beautiful point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there needs to be, on especially on a board game project, there needs to be at least one reward level that very clearly says this is the complete game, period. Like this is, if you want everything, this is it. And maybe there's a lower pr- pledge level. And I usually like it to be maybe the first or second pledge level that is the actual game. It's like, here's the game, block, core game. Here's the one that you're going to get all our, ex- the first expansion, anything we unlock and stretch goals. Exactly. Clearly labeled. Yeah. Now, Jamie, do you, do you agree with Mac when he says that there's a sweet spot of around 10 and there's too many that can really be confusing? Yeah, and Mac alluded to, to both sides of it. For me, it's it's not just the reward levels, but it is the add-ons, which Mac said as well. I, I think if I if I look at a project page that has a ton of different add-ons, I know they're going to have a hard time with fulfillment unless they have a really good fulfillment system worked out. Or it's all digital or something. Or it's all digital. Yeah, digital, that's that's definitely a different world, but physical items. And there, there's at least one notable exception to that rule, which is, of course, the Reaper, which yeah. has a inbuilt, they kind of move you over to their second purchasing system where they take your, your pledge and move you over there and you basically spend your pledge. Dwarven uh, Forge did kind of the same thing with theirs. And Dwarven Forge, again, did theirs very well. So there, if you've got the technical acumen, you can definitely overcome this hurdle. I, I would say one other red flag to mention is, uh, I think I kind of alluded to this before, but usually when I go to a project page, I look at the comments on the main page, and I'll just click on it, and I'll, I'll skim through maybe 10 or 20 comments. And you can usually tell right away from the tone of those comments how the project is going, Um, (laughs) both from the comments from the backers and the way the creator is interacting with those backers or not interacting at all. And usually, to me, that says, okay, if if they're not interacting during the project in the main comment section, then what kind of communication am I going to get from them over the next six months when they're trying to actually build and and deliver this thing? Right. And I would say for me, like one of the big things is uh i would say a a distinct lack of energy or passion Mm. in your video probably the worst in the video or in your writing i i have seen some kickstarters that are extremely bland as far as their their description 
you know, this is a, you know, project about guys on a mountain. And you're like, um, okay, that sounds pretty bland. And then you start the video and you see a guy and he says, hello, I want to tell you about my game. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) I want to learn more about guys on a mountain, Ross. I'm just saying, I, there's, there's, if there's a distinct lack of energy and passion in the way that they're communicating to me, just the core of what they're offering, that's a warning sign. Uh, yeah. One that you, one that just popped in my head when you said that is, you mentioned the writing, spell check and proofread. God's sake, if I see a T H E I R when there should be a T H E Y apostrophe R E, you're done. That means that you have not put the energy into having someone else read over this to make sure you didn't screw up. If I see sloppy writing, if I see inconsistent writing, I, you put your first draft up there. You haven't thought this through. You haven't planned. You're not taking this seriously. I don't know. I, uh, I repeat, repeatedly have to deal with people who, uh, would like to de- debate the Oxford comma with me. <laughs> <laughs> what, what debate? You should always use the Oxford comma. You and I are in agreement, but uh, okay. the internet is not always uh, on board with our <laughs> genius. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, well, like, obviously uh, that, that's going to depend on you know a lot of factors. But I think what Daryl's point is is that it's it's a sloppy approach to the initial creation of the page. And I'm exaggerating a little bit with that one example, but yeah, proofread, spell check. This is basic stuff, guys. Well, I think I think Jeremy would, or sorry, Jamie would would uh, agree with me if I said that the more professional your page looks, the better the impression it's going to make. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I would say the one the one caveat to that uh, because I, I and we've talked about art and design how that's so important, but I, I found that personally, if I see a project page that looks almost too professional and you kind of touched upon this with kind of if you use a dry professional tone of writing instead of a passionate personal tone right that professional tone distances me from the project a little bit so i I usually like really good looking art and design and really good writing but just with a little personal touch maybe a little rough around the edges to show me that this is a person behind it and not a giant company if it, yeah, if it sounds like Ben Stein wrote it, you should probably not. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying stick to the Chicago Manual style here or anything like that, but I'm just saying proofread and spell check. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and part of that is what you know Jamie's brought up yeah. is tone. You know, make sure it make sure it reaches out to your readers. Right. Would you, you agree with that, Mac? Yeah, I think it's also there's a um, he touched on a little bit of of one of the problems you can bump into, which is uh, coming off looking like you're a bigger company than you are. I know I'm constantly battling the assumption that Weird is this monolithic, you know, Hasbro-sized company. People wait. Will, you mean you're not? not. Yeah, <laughs> my company employs employs like I think there are six people in my office, maybe seven. You know, <laughs> you, dude, you have an office that sets you apart right there. Well, fair, but a lot of people make this <laughs> assumption that you know we have all these giant machines and they're constantly running. And we're just spitting out plastics left, right, and center. And, and the, our production abilities are, because we've done such a good job of looking very professional and, and hopefully comporting ourselves in a very professional way, people make the assumption that, you know, we can spit out 100,000, you know, plastic sprues in a week, you know? Right. Well, I think the key, Mac, is that you are aware of that perception. Because you're aware that you can combat it when you, when you run a project to let people know that th- these are... Uh, this is a team of six humans, six people running this project, not not Hasbro. Well, I'm aware of it now. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I do got to say, that's one thing I always love is seeing the bios of the people who work for the company, even if it's just, this is our receptionist so-and-so. Yeah. It, it's nice to see that human touch. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, you know, let's draw this out to actually a real-world example, um, something that I think both Jamie and Mac are probably aware of. Uh, there was a Kickstarter not so long ago, for a product called The Doom that came to Atlantic City. Uh, Forking Path. Yeah, oh yeah. Mac? I am not familiar with this one. Okay. Uh, Well, Jamie, why don't you tell us about The Doom that came to Atlantic City and what we can learn about it? Uh, it, The Doom that came to Atlantic City was a a board game project that raised about $120,000, a significant amount. (laughs) $122,874. Someone's on the website. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Well, also, uh, for, former guest uh, Keith Baker was the designer of this game, not the publisher that was involved, for the record. Right. Yeah, I think there were three guys involved, and the, 
the publisher, after he funded this project, he, I believe he moved to Portland and he used some of the funds to move to Portland. And I, I think he had the best intentions when he moved to Portland to, to work on this project there. But in the end, months later down the road, he came out with a project update that said, hey, we're out of money and we're not going to we're not going to make this product. We're not going to make this game. And it kind of caused a it reasonably so caused an uproar on Kickstarter. I think some people lost some, some confidence in Kickstarter after that. Well, certainly. And, and I think one of the things that I took away from that whole situation was that, you know, when he when he did kind of talk about where the money went, he said, well, I was going to use that to start a company yeah. to make games. And I remember, yeah, but that's not what the Kickstarter was for. The Kickstarter was to make this one individual game. You know? right. And for the record, that is currently in courts. Well, they did, you know, I think that there's a happy ending to this particular story is that another company yes. stepped in and is now going to publish that game. Daryl here with just a quick interruption. I thought I knew the story of the doom that came to Atlantic City so well that I didn't bother pulling up any resources when we were recording. Yeah, bad on me because I screwed up. Uh, the company that actually ended up picking up the doom that came to Atlantic City was Cryptozoic. Not cool, mini or not. Thank you very much, Jamie, for emailing me and letting me know before we publish this. Uh, both of these are great companies, but I wanted to make sure the Cryptozoic got the credit they deserve for going above and beyond and fulfilling at least some of the Kickstarter stretch goals that were promised to backers, even though they didn't get any of the Kickstarter money. So with that said, back to the recording. What happened was right. when... uh. When he said, I'm not making the company, the company's folded, we're done, the license then reverted back to Keith Baker. Keith Baker said, I'm going to release what I've got free print-to-play to all our backers. Then, Cool Mini or Not was now in a new situation where they could license it from Keith Baker, said, okay, we're going to license it now because we can, we wanted it in the first place, we just couldn't do it because of funds and other reasons. So they now license it, now they're saying, we are out of our own pocket going to pay to give all the backers their games. And I think there's really two things to look at specifically there is number one, that the Kickstarter was very successful. There was a lot of interest in it and, and it gained so much awareness, not only from its spectacular rise, but also from its rather unfortunate, you know, circumstances at the end that so many people were already interested in the game that it made sense for cool mini or not on a, you know, on a funding level, on a money level to just, yeah, let's make this game. There's, there's going to be people who are looking for this game in the store now. Right. Oh, yeah. And and not to downplay how how you know magnanimous that was of Cool Mini no, or it not, was. Was. yeah. But they, I certainly believe that that it not only was an opportunity for them to do something nice for the community, but it was also an opportunity for them to produce a game that will sell. I think they will in time make their money back, but they're certainly looking at a larger expenditure out the door to get to that point. And right. and I I commend them. For and the second thing to take away from that, in my opinion, is that Kickstarter is truly. I think the the new modern era's judge of your integrity. Yeah. Because that guy, whoever that guy is, I don't remember his name, but if that guy ever tries to do another Kickstarter, yeah, there's going to be, you know, a lot of problems with that and I don't I, it would be very difficult I think for him to, you know, succeed in that in that marketplace. My point is is that because of the way that Kickstarter turned out, it is a lasting record of your ability to do what you promised to do. Yeah, if he if he puts up another uh, Kickstarter at all, someone will bid a buck to make sure that people know it in the comments. Yeah, <laughs> right. They will they will pledge a buck to be able to comment and then withdraw it before it ends. So, so this is so this is my point is that Kickstarter really is kind of a thing you can point to and say this is a record of me doing what I said I would do, and that there's there's a lot of value in that. That's a great point. I've never thought about Kickstarter that way, but just the the way it. It functions as a, as a permanent record of what you've done and what you've said you'll you'll deliver on. That's Absolutely. a great point. Yeah. Well, I, and I mean that's that's one of the things I tell people who are planning on thinking about you know they want to kickstart something, and I always say to them don't approach this casually because this this first one that you do is the most important one you will ever have. Because right. if you fail at this first one, I mean it doesn't mean that you'll never succeed, but it means you will have a much harder time in the future. If you don't do the, the first one right. And then there, you also have problems, which this no one knows exactly what went on. There are some where we know exactly what went on. The guy that lost his house, uh, Glory to Rome. Yeah. 
What happened was he forgot to check a box on the shipping, which said stack no larger than three high, and half his inventory got crushed on the boat from China, and he had to reprint. And, lo- and lost, he had a second home, but he had to basically sell it to cover the Kickstarter. Oh. Well, that's, but you know, but in the, at the end of the day, though, that didn't affect his integrity or, or his ability to do another Kickstarter in the future. I mean, that was, that's, a, that's a reasonable mistake. Yeah, it's a reasonable mistake. It's just something that should be a, a warning to people who are wanting to start a Kickstarter. This guy right. actually went through and fulfilled it, so good, good on him. He sold right. his house to make sure this went yeah, through. Yeah, and because that's what he felt it was worth to, you know, basically preserve his integrity. And, and I, I completely, you know, I'm, I'm on the side of him for doing that. I think he's great for doing that. But it, this, you know, this kind of goes down to the idea of like when you update people, like one of the Kickstarter warning signs is, is the nature of the updates, right? If, if mm. the nature of the updates are telling you, like, let's say this guy who did the, the Doom from Atlantic City, if he had been sending updates to people saying, okay, so here's the thing, I am now going to start a, a company and do these things and had been very transparent all along, the fallout from, from the situation would not nearly have been so bad. That's very fair. The uh, the only uh, trick you're going to have, especially as a uh, first timer or even you know even an experienced uh, manufacturer, is a lot of times there is nothing to report for a long period of time. Fair enough. But there, uh, what I'm getting at is you know even if it's infrequent, if you are very you know open and honest about what's going on, I think that's always going to be a good sign as opposed to a warning sign. Oh, that's fair. Yeah, the the thing that I've learned firsthand is that. Uh, having some news, even if it's bad news, is way better than no news at all. I, I can't remember which one it was, but there was one that uh, from this past month where basically the if you look through the guy's updates, it's a year and a half almost of, yeah, everything's going fine. We're about three months away. Well, everything's going fine. We're about three months away. Six months later, everything's going fine. We're about three months away. We got this, this latest, and, but everything's going fine. We're good to go now. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it's like, well, we're kind of boned. Our company, the company we're doing our fulfillment through decided to triple our price. But I'm like, but you said you were already going to manufacturing. Mm-hmm. There's another infamous po- uh, uh, Kickstarter actually in the RPG world that's got some issues with with that. Um, there was a project called Far West, which actually completed, um, I want to say, more than two years ago. And every update, well, not every update, the many, many, a significant number of updates have been things like it is now going to be ready in two weeks. And of course, two weeks later, it is now going to be ready in three weeks. <laughs> and, uh, you know, again, for two, for, for more than two years, you know, when, when something becomes vaporware, you know, that's kind of an <laughs> issue. How, how far past your target ship date do you think it is before you, you really start to worry? Probably, well, I mean, I'm a fairly forgiving guy. So, like, for me specifically, I would say probably six months. That's just, that's a, that was honestly a question I'm curious about because we're behind schedule and I'm, I'm kind of curious, like, I know what's going on and we've, you know, we, we know exactly and we've explained it to our backers that, you know, there was, there was issues getting everything in the warehouse to ship out and we're, we're on it. But, you know, we're showing them, you know, we're sending out the PDFs and stuff like that. But, but part of me is always concerned that I'm not, do, you know, there's, a, there's only so much I can do. But at the same time, we're five months right. behind and it's driving me insane. So yeah, I was, I was just curious was about that. But you're not also saying, you know, just two more weeks, just two more weeks. True. If I get, just two, if I get just two more weeks for three months, I'm getting worried. Yeah. Okay. If I get, we ran into this delay, it's going to take us an extra month. Well, we ran into this delay, where it's going to take us an extra three weeks. As long as you're upfront and honest with me, I'm going to give you a lot of leeway. That's true. Yeah, because back in September, we were like, yeah, it's going to be near the end of first quarter 2013. That's where we're looking now. And, you know, we were kind of upfront about that. It was a longer delay than we'd like, but, you know, there's... Not much you can do about it when it's not, you know, physically going to exist. Right. So we're talking about when something goes wrong after you've completed your Kickstarter. Now, Jamie, you've done two. Did you ever have something that went wrong after it was complete? After I had fulfilled the, the products? After funding. After funding, yeah. Fortunately, nothing big. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you the, the biggest thing that, that went wrong. Unfortunately, it was very small. We, we were able to deliver Viticulture on time and we were able to deliver Euphoria on time. With one exception, there was a pallet of games um, that was headed to the Amazon.co.uk fulfillment center, but it was labeled uh, by my factory for Amazon.ca up in Canada. <laughs> and even though it was clearly headed to the right, well, I guess it not clearly, like from my perspective, it was clearly headed to the right place. But when it showed up at Amazon.co.uk, they said, nope, we we were expecting something labeled for us. And so they sent it 
they sent it back. <laughs> and they didn't send it back to China, fortunately. They sent it back to a, a warehouse in England where we paid the people at the warehouse to strip down the pallet, relabel it, put the pallet back together, and then send it back to Amazon. Did you have to pay for that? Because it wasn't your mistake. No, I didn't have to pay for it. My my manufacturer paid for it. But I, I paid for it in the same way that Mac is feeling it right now, where I, I all the other backers in the UK got their games, except for this one, I guess, 100 backers whose games were on this pallet. And it was just kind of a month of agony, where I just really wanted to give them their games, but I, I couldn't, I was kind of out of my control. So I kept them in the loop. I told them I kept, with constant updates. But after a certain point, you just have to say, okay, th- this is what's happening. I'm going to tell you when, when the pallet arrives. And I'm on top of this. And they, they trusted me by that point to, to do what I said I would do. Well, that, that sounds like a great way to handle it. There's yeah. one thing I've got to say about uh, Jamie. Uh, very recently on Reddit, about, two, about a week or two before we recorded this, there was a discussion on the board game subreddit uh, where people were talking about anyone that they think are, are the best and worst companies at Kickstarter. There were a lot of different various answers for worse. There was almost one unanimous answer for best company for Kickstarter, and that was Stone Mare. Everyone yeah. had great things to say about it, and a lot of people went on and on about your uh, you kind of started something with uh, offering refunds to backers. Yeah, we have a money-back guarantee where if, if you don't like the game or you discover you don't want it within a month of receiving it, you can send it back to us and we'll refund your full your your pledge amount. So uh, kind of back to the trust idea that Ross talked about. It's another way to build trust. Yeah, that's something that in a lot of retail markets you have to do under state laws. You do not have to do that in Kickstarter because they're not buying the game. They're pledging and getting a reward. Exactly. So, yeah, just to follow up quickly with something I'd said earlier, uh, Far West funded on August 25th, 2011. So we're looking at almost three years. And the uh, most recent update is from February 25th, which says I am working as hard as I can on getting the book out. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I mean, good for him on, you know, communication, but definitely past the point. I, I think there's probably a reasonable point of of people wanting, you know, basically their money back. And I, I think he probably passed that point with that project. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's just me, you know. I really like that uh, money back guarantee idea. I may have to steal that. Steal? I, I encourage people to steal that idea. How, how, many t- how many takers have you had on it, though? So for Viticulture, we had 942 backers, and we delivered about 1,300 games because a lot of them were bulk purchases, and no one requested it. And then with Euphoria, we... We had about 4,700 backers, and I delivered wow. about about 5,700 games to backers. And two people requested and immediately got refunds for their games. That is a lot of backers. Yeah, well, it, it was a lot of backers, a lot of games. And I honestly, I expected more because it's, I mean, uh, Daryl, you've seen the game. It maybe is a yeah. little more complex than, than some people thought. Yeah, but... it's, that's one of the reasons why it's taken me so long to get it is that <laughs> the only worker placement game I've ever played is Lords of Waterdeep, really. Lords of Waterdeep is the kiddie pool. This is the high dive into the deep end when it comes to <laughs> worker placement games. However, I've got to say, I am surprised you had just that small delay. The game is gorgeous, and there's so many really awesome components in it that I don't know how the hell something didn't screw up somewhere with those components, man. Yeah, we. I, I have a good manufacturer. I use Panda manu, ga, Panda Game Manufacturing in uh, in China, and they're they're fantastic to work with. No, I want to ask you guys one other question. Uh, we're getting close to our last call here, so I want to make sure it's a really good one. Can either of you gentlemen think of a Kickstarter that was, in your opinion, exceptionally well done? And can you tell us why? You know the the one that comes to mind. Um, I'm going to pick from the the ones that I actually backed. Um, I backed a few. I backed Reaper, and I was very happy with what I received. Um, and I backed them again, and I'm waiting. You know, the Reaper two. I'm waiting on that. And I thought they did a pretty, you know, pretty great job of communicating and getting me a product that I was very happy with. But the one that kind of blew me out of water was the Dwarven Forge. Oh um, yeah. I got so much product for such an inexpensive price. I'm kind of concerned that he's going to drive himself out of business. Uh, they're doing it again. And they're doing they're it. They're launching. Again. They're launching like in the next couple of days for caverns. Yeah, and I, I really, I use it every week in my Pathfinder game. Uh, it was very easy for me to paint up. I'm very happy with the product itself, but I was also very happy with how we ran the Kickstarter because within minutes of me of me getting to the page, someone's like, "Hey, Dwarven Forge." I'm like, "Oh, I know that. I've seen them at Gen Con." 
they're doing a, a Kickstarter. Well, let me check that out. I was very quickly able to assess the value, see that I wanted it, make my bid at the exact level I knew I would want because I knew exactly how many pieces that would be. They had pictures of what I could assemble at each, at each level. It was spot on exactly what I needed to see to let me evaluate where my bid dollars were going. And I thought that was really well done, and I, I hopefully learned a lot from it. Well, they did raise almost $2 million, which is wow. very impressive. And uh, what I think is also interesting is if you look at the, the, the levels and everything, the, uh, the most backers that they had were uh, around the $250 level, which is uh, really impressive. Yeah, I went with the 165 which got me two sets and all the unlocks, and then I got one add-on pack. That's exactly what so, I did. So, And how much was that for the pledge level? 165 and I got – Jesus, it was – it was the densest box I've ever seen. It was like a two feet by one foot by one foot solid. So it was good communication and a good a good value, and it was you know good. It just it looked great, and you knew what you were getting. It, it was laid out so perfectly. It was all they had tons of add on packs. We could add on these little accessories like extra doors or extra walls or little like piles of treasure gold and stuff like that, and you knew. Because they had several different ones broken down. You knew exactly what you were getting from every single one of those. Jamie, what's uh, what's a Kickstarter you thought went really, really well? Well, I can think of plenty of Kickstarters that haven't delivered yet that went really well. But I like that Mac answered one that, that had delivered. So the one that comes to mind for me is a game called Dungeon Roll. Um, it's produced by a guy named Michael Mendez of Tasty Minstrel Games. Mm-hmm. And I could pr- pretty much repeat everything that Max said. I-, I feel like I got an amazing value for the product. I thought the project page was really eye-catching and clear. I-, I-, I knew which level I wanted almost right away, and I felt that it was a very fair price. I probably would have paid more for it. Uh, maybe I should have now that I- I'm looking at it. But it- I paid $15 for a game with somewhere between 20 and 30 custom dice. And... I, and I really enjoy the game, too. It's not a game that I, I break out to the table all the time, but I, I was really, really happy with the product and, and the follow-up, the customer service. Everything really came together for that, that project. They raised $250,000 from, I think, over 10,000 backers. They had a lot of backers on that. Yeah, I've heard a lot about that game. Yeah. And, you know, not to downplay your own, uh, Euphoria, actually, was a really very successful Kickstarter. I mean, uh, 4,700 backers and $300,000. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that at all. And uh, those those boxes have been shipped out. Is that right? Yeah, they were shipped out in back in December. Yeah. So, off, yeah, that's when we uh, shipped out our books for Accursed. So. Nice. Awesome. Uh, we're still working on some of the, the, the stretch goal stuff, but we're getting – that's almost done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you have any add-ons or did you, did you send out everything in December? So my, my model basically involves having the manufacturer put everything in the box and maybe having different barcodes for different boxes. So I had three different versions of the game. They were all packed at the manufacturer and then delivered okay. by Amazon. So I saw very few copies myself. I think I saw like five copies and signed those copies and sent them out. But yeah, I, I had to handle very few games personally. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, so we're going to come down to uh, pretty much uh, our last call is going to involve... Uh, me once again talking to you guys about uh, what your latest thing is, where we can find you on the web, and uh, that things of that nature. Uh, Mac, why don't you go first? What is the newest thing coming from you in Weird Games, and where can we find you on the interwebs? Well, we're at uh, weird-games.net. Um, currently, I'm still working on Through the Breach. The books themselves have gone off to the printer, but I'm working uh, hard to uh, get our first adventure uh, off to uh, print, written by uh, someone that Ross may know. Uh, <laughs> Ross wrote it, in, incidentally. Uh, so <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm allowed to say about it. So I'm gonna. <laughs> uh, you know, we don't really have too much of a gag order here at Weird. So yeah, uh, it's a it's a pretty fun adventure where uh, I'm really loving it. Where Ross has really done a great job of laying out this snapshot of this town and this place and time where our adventures are less about a linear progression of events and more about a sandbox to play in. You know, kind of aiming for that Grand Theft Auto approach to an area you know a lot, a lot of side things to do a lot of you know a, a overarching event that's happening and that's just really fun to lay out and kind of play with and i'm that's the next thing i'll be getting into the kick the the testers i should i should just quickly mention um the gm that runs our Shadowrun game and our actual play is brandon gensimer and he also worked on uh this particular product which is called 
Oh yeah, it's called In Defense of Innocence. Okay, yeah, we were we both worked on that together, so um, people out there should know that our GM is is one of the guys. But then in my uh, the rest of my time is spent working on a uh, miniatures uh, game called Rune Planet, which is just a dream. I love working on miniatures games. What's what is tell the listeners what is Rune Planet? Now I know you were on the D six generation, and you probably told them like way more in detail about it. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys have four hours. We only have two, so you know. But please tell us, tell us the the elevator pitch for Rune Planet. Uh, the thirty second elevator pitch is uh, Earth is a wasteland. Factions represent various different types of uh, science fiction apocalypses. They're at war with each other over the uh, remnants of Earth. Uh, everything from the United States and Canada have fl- fleeing to orbit to kind of a uh, body snatchers slash zombies faction that's very disease you know, a disease apocalypse to genetic apocalypses and to even one that's purely social. It was a nonviolent social apocalypse. Is it like a meme apocalypse? It is, actually. It is a meme a meme. It's like 4chan exploded into our world? Uh, basically. <laughs> oh, God, no. Um, no. <laughs> sentient computers used Facebook no. to pretend to be people. <laughs> <laughs> that is the scariest apocalypse I can imagine. I'm just being overrun by goat C and lolcats. They, well, all they had to do was manipulate the memes until we all didn't want to be in power. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. And are there robots? There are at least two factions that are heavily uh, robot. Is there anything special you can tell us about these robots? I got in trouble for telling too much before. Uh, oh, okay, <laughs> okay, fair enough. We don't want to get you in trouble. The, the Japanese is the, the faction uh, that I'm going to be taking a look at next. Um, they're actually not the Japanese so much as the Kairobo Utopia, which is that social apocalypse I discussed where uh, in the future the, the servant robots and the computers kind of take over and there's this shift in our, public, in our, in our um, zeitgeist where rather than seeing – personal property is the core of of morality secrets are are then the core of morality and that no one should have them you know something is immoral because you're keeping it a secret so with that there's a huge cultural shift in what people expect how buildings are produced writing all that kind of stuff and a huge portion of the population moves just to you know becoming artists where the robots take care of them see tech astronomy no more secrets no more secrets so that sounds awesome. And when can we expect to see more about this on the interwebs? Oh, it's in very early, like the fun part. You know that fun part at the beginning of a project where you're just yes, I do writing a bunch of new <laughs> stuff, and it's all pie in the sky. Just hope fun stuff right now. So eventually, real- reality set will set in, and I'll have more uh, accurate information like that. And we can find that at weird-games.com. Uh, not really. <laughs> there's, a, no, okay. there's like one thread where some people listen to D6G uh, and they're they're chatting about it. Uh, we will eventually see that on. Eventually, that'll be at WeirdGames.net. But then, right. uh, Fall Schematics Kickstarter starts next week sometime. Again, I'm really not involved with it at all. Um, and that's that uh, card game slash video game hybrid that uh, we're working with, drawn by clouds. Ha! Huh. I remember the company's name now. You can tell how involved I am, right? Yeah. Well, you're, you've been super busy with Through the Breach and Malifaux Second Edition, if I remember right. So yeah, th- those were my those are the products I kind of had to work on in tandem. <laughs> All right. Do you have a personal web page? I do. Uh, Nerdetree dot com. N e r d e t r y dot com. And it's really just a blog of my ramblings and soon maybe a podcast. Ooh. Well, hey, you know you can always come to us if you want to do some cross promotion. That'll be fun. And, and we are expanding our Gamers Tavern network. We always are. Now, uh, Mr. Stegmeier, yeah. would you please tell us about your latest thing and where we can find you on the interwebs? Yeah, I'll, uh, so tomorrow I'm launching a Kickstarter. I guess we're recording this on March 11th, and I'm, I'm launching a Kickstarter on March 12th for an expansion pack to my game Viticulture. Uh, the expansion pack is called Tuscany, and it's what you call a, a legacy-style expansion pack. In that Ooh. every every game that you play kind of affects the next game, um, and then and the game after that, and so and so on. So you're you're constantly ex- expanding this world um, of of Tuscany and, a, and of, of viticulture. This which, is a, which for our listeners who don't know what a legacy style game is that much, one of the most popular ones is Risk Legacy, which it's basically campaign style play in a board game where. 
when certain events happen, things change in the game permanently. Like you rip up this card, you open up this envelope to add stuff to the game. Right. That, that's kind of what you're doing, right? That's that's exactly right. And in in Tuscany, we've kind of simplified it a little bit where really the core legacy element is if you win the game, you get to make a you get to unlock a new expansion that will be added permanent permanently to the game from then on. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, and it doesn't necessarily happen every time you play. Like you might play with an expansion a few times and then the the second or third time you play, that's going to be like that's the important game where you really have to win it. Now, I do play some more games. I played Lord of, Lords of Waterdeep, really like it. Um, I've played uh, Kingsburg, it's probably my favorite. Mm-hmm. Um, now that's a dice placement game, I believe. Yeah. And so if, if if you were going to pitch your game to someone like myself, hypothetically speaking, mm-hmm. how would you do that? It, this game is actually very similar to Lords of Waterdeep in that it's a, a worker placement game, but unlike Lords of Water, Waterdeep, the theme is... Uh, kind of real life wine making and 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 running a vineyard, not uh, a fantasy theme. Okay. But yeah. the The core of the game is a worker placement game. Okay. Uh, and, Carcassonne is probably one of the best known of that as well. Would you say that your game couples well with a couple bottles of wine? Yeah, that's that's the ideal market for the game. Yeah, people who love wine and and uh, and who like board games. And you're about to correct me on Carcassonne, I think. Uh, yeah, Carcassonne is it's known as a tile placement game. There is some worker placement mm-hmm. on it, but worker placement usually means when there are limited spaces Agricola. where the workers can go. Agricola. I, I yes. apologize. Agricola. Agricola was the one I was thinking. About. Agricola. Yeah. My apologies. Agricola is a, a classic worker placement. Yeah. Why are there so many games about <laughs> farming? <laughs> <laughs> because Settlers of Catan was so fucking awesome. Well. I, I just, it's sorry. Agricola is it's <laughs> often brought up on the D6 generation, so I just thought I'd mention it here. Uh, but yes, that sounds really cool. And where can we find this on the internets? Uh, it'll be on Kickstarter under Tuscany, but you can also find me and uh, the blog entries I write about Kickstarter, especially if you're listening to this and you're a potential Kickstarter creator. You might find value in the Kickstarter lessons that I've written at uh, stonemeyergames.com. I would definitely recommend anyone who's thinking about kickstarting anything. Um, like, for example, I will be absolutely perusing this uh, this area. Should definitely check out Jamie's page because he has put down an awful lot of his thoughts on kickstarters and the lessons he's learned from them. And I believe that that is a a very strong repository of crowdfunding wisdom. So once again, what is that? It's StoneMeyerGames dot com. Uh, do you guys do show notes? Will you show yes. the okay? Yeah, well, that'll we're show have... notes. That'll help people. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. And uh, from Daryl and I, we both want to say that we're very grateful for you guys for coming on on board the uh, Gamers Tavern and sharing your your knowledge with us because uh, we love getting experts to tell us what to do when it comes to their expert opinion. (laughs) Thanks for having us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. You know, one thing we didn't talk about too much is that there are those other places out there to go like Indiegogo and Patreon and GoFundMe, places like that. Uh-huh. Uh, the, the two biggest ones right now are Kickstarter and Indiegogo. The biggest difference is Indiegogo. If you back something on Indiegogo, the backers get the money, period, whether they fund or not. The only difference is the percentage that Indiegogo takes out of the fund once the campaign's over. That goes from 9% to 4.5%. That's going to be about it for Gamers Tavern. Uh, Mac has given us the eye. The Imperial Guards are marching by to make sure everyone shuts their doors at the appropriate time this evening. So thank you all for listening. Thank you guys for showing up and being on our, our podcast. Thank you. Thank you. And until next time, may all your hits be crits. So that about wraps things up for this week. Tune in next week when we have guest Ivan Van Norman joining us again, along with Mark Carroll, to talk about how to get started in role-playing and how to introduce gaming to your friends. Because we did these episodes sort of back-to-back to get on schedule again, there's no comments this week, but I would really like to thank our assistant editor, Nicholas Jaworski's hard work on this episode. I'm really glad to have him on board, and he has taken so much off my plate. It is amazing. Thank you so much, Nicholas. If you would like to support the Gamers Tavern, you can visit our store at gamerstavern.org slash store and purchase t-shirts, coffee mugs, flasks, playing cards, and other great items, including the You Gotta Be Crittin' Me t-shirt. 
You can also visit our sponsors and affiliates, like us on Facebook, review us on iTunes. If you would like to meet Ross and I in person, we are now both going to be attending Comic Palooza in Houston, Texas, May 23rd through the 26th. More information can be found at comicpalooza.com. This podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons non-commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 license. Music credits are available in the show notes. Until next time, the tavern is closed.